I'm Susan Mitchell Summers, um, professor of history at St. Vincent College in Pennsylvania. And I'd like to welcome you to the eighth lecture of the inaugural year of Open Lectures on Freemasonry, a series born of this pandemic and, and which we hope will far outlive the virus. Our lecture today is C Professor Cécile Révanger, who will deliver a talk entitled Behind the Lodge Door, How Lodges Spend Their Time in France and England. This is a subject dear to Cécile's heart. Her doctoral thesis was on 18th century Freemasonry in Britain and um, what became the United States. She has since extended her scope to include a careful reading of, of the records of Masonic practices in France, the result of which is a book to be published in April by, pardon my French, Derve Editions, um, Que Faire en Loge. What, what, what happens, how is it going in the lodge? A comparative study of lodge practices in France, Britain, and the United States. Cecile is one of the most prolific and distinguished academics at work in the history of Freemasonry today. She has, to borrow Masonic expressions, made and raised five doctoral students in the study of Freemasonry, ensuring another generation of fine scholarship to come. She has written numerous books on various aspects of Freemasonry, paying particular attention to brothers and sisters whose ethnicity or gender have been construed as obstacles to their participation in Freemasonry. In addition, she's the author, editor and co-editor of two of the most important recent scholarly works on Freemasonry, Le Monde Mécanique and British Freemasonry, 1717 to 1813, the latter of which she will discuss in this venue in January with co-editor Jan Snook and general editor Robert Pater. Be sure to join us then. Now it's my great pleasure to turn the microphone over to Cecile. who will have to unmute herself, I believe. Well, Okan? That's it, fine. Can you hear me now? Great, all right. Well, thank you very much. To In the very kind introduction, but having a look at all the messages, and it's really moving to see so many people uh, brought together thanks to Open LFM. So thank you to the organizers of Open LFM, to Ramsey, and to all of you. Um, so today, yes, indeed, I would like to tell you a little about well, something you know very well, most of you, but. Uh, it will be a comparative approach. So behind the lodge door, how lodges spend their time in France and England. Well, Freemasons throughout the world have the same rites, the same symbols. Meet in lodges, call one another brothers, and more and more so sisters. Yet, behind the lodge doors, they behave quite differently in London, Glasgow, New York, Paris. Indeed, a close study of the minutes of about a hundred lodges of the Grand Orient since the 18th century brings to the, to the fore several common points, but also many differences between French and English lodges. So what I'm doing here is history from below, in fact. That is to say, it's the point of view of the lodges, uh, which is here at the core of my study, rather than the Grand Lodges themselves. Now, because of the coronavirus, lodges have interrupted their activities throughout the world. So now is a good time to reflect on what Masons actually do during lodge meetings in different places. 
they all devote a lot of time to the ceremonies, the making, passing, and raising of masons, and to the ritual. But their approach to the actual work inside the lodge differs. As early as the beginning of the 19th century, French masons started reflecting on social issues behind the, behind the lodge door. So Masonic values are universal, but Masonic time indeed reflects cultural identity. So uh, here in this presentation, I shall not focus, be reassured on a hundred lodges, but just six or seven, and uh, rather French lodges, French lodges of the Grand Orient, um, from the end of the 18th century till the uh, uh, the 18th century till the end of the um, 20th century. So bear in mind that women were only admitted in the Grand Orient in 2010, with the exception, of course, of the lodges of adoption in the 18th century. Therefore, this presentation will indeed be um, very much focused on brethren and very little on sisters. Sorry about that. Now, I did not really want to discuss uh, recent lodges, not so much because I wanted to keep secrets, but because I prefer to respect the privacy of Masons alive, and to remain a little discreet maybe, and also because any historical approach uh, requires critical distance, that is to say hindsight, and of course, um, we, I mean, only journalists, I think, can discuss current events, uh, not historians. So I promised a comparative approach, but of course I'm cheating a little here because as you can see with this list, I'm focusing on the French lodges, on French lodges of the Grand Orient de France, more precisely today, uh, since I assume you're are all have a very with British lodges and um, so this is why today I shall focus uh, on, on the French side and um, I shall in fact deal with three points today. First, how often did or do lodges meet? Second, lodge business and ceremonies and third, the planche, the so-called planche in France and or lectures if you like. So how often did lodges meet? Well, the first universal duty of a mason, the most elementary one, is to attend lodge meetings. But from the start, regular attendance has indeed been a problem in all lodges. And a lot of French regulations try to guarantee regular attendance in the old days. In the early 19th century, there were fines for lack of attendance. Uh, if you look at Lodge Le Père de Famille in Angers, <laughs> well, they really had uh, a carrot and stick policy, a very elaborate system. So the stick, absent members were fined if they did not have a good reason to be absent. But the fines were attributed to the charity fund of the lodge. And now the carrot members were given half a token every time they attended a lodge meeting held in the first degree. A token was worth one franc. And at the end of the year, the tokens were deducted from their annual subscription, an incentive. Likewise, l'encyclopédique in Toulouse. Um, between 1823 and 1826 was very invented inventive, sorry. It rewarded members with a quarter of a candle every time they attended a lodge meeting. So no wonder a co-maker, dear brother Taillefer, was made a mason in that lodge during that period. Now, why was there such a need to encourage attendance? Well, transport was not as easy as today, for one thing. Then um, brethren were, were plagued with bad weather, bad roads, uh, uncomfortable, poorly heated premises. And apparently, lodges met very, very 
frequently, sometimes weekly or even more. Thus, L'Encyclopédique in Toulouse met 68 times and made 37 new masons just in one year in 1800. No wonder such members found it hard to keep pace with the very demanding schedule. In 1817, Lodge Litrinosov, by the way, Litrinosov means three times wise. So Lodge Litrinosov in Paris met at a more reasonable pace, twice a month. The first meeting of the month was devoted to the reception of new masons, which proves that a lot of initiations took place at that time. Now, of course, the meeting places were essential. In France, they varied from to specific more and more costly meeting places. Well, in Britain, we all know that the first lodges met in the in inns and in the local inns. And uh, apart from the very prestigious Freemasons Hall in 1776, which almost ruined the Grand Lodge of Moderns at the time, um, well, uh, Masons did not really buy, I mean, their premises. Well, they waited for the Limited Liability Act of 1855, which limited the financial risks for associations of more than 25 members. And Andrew Prescott explained at one point that lodge meetings became more frequent after that in order to cover the costs. Well, during the French Revolution, virtually all the lodges ceased to meet after 1793. A few were revived in the 19th century, but a lot of the new ones emerged under Napoleon. Similarly, in wartime, in the 20th century, Masonic activity slowed down or was totally suspended. Yet some lodges tried to maintain an activity uh, among brothers, even during World War II, in a clandestine manner. Now, uh, this was, uh, this would need a long development, but this was the case of the network Patriam Recuperare, uh, which is at the bottom of this list here, which was a real network um, of uh, brethren belonging to the French resistance. Right. Um, in Martinique, in faraway Martinique, there is also another example of um, uh, members of the lodge uh, organizing themselves and helping uh, people from the French resistance to uh, flee to the neighboring English island, St. Lucia, for instance. Well, just two examples among many. Now, the practice for, but, but um, yes, the practice for French lodges uh, today is to meet twice a month in the first degree. And of course, there may be additional meetings for the third degree or funeral meetings. So coronavirus is really a unique phenomenon in the history of the lodges. There's never before had all the lodges ceased their activities on account of a sanitary crisis. So today, uh, well, at least in France, there are a few attempts at Zoom meetings, even for lodges, but generally without the ritual. And, um, well, they are not very, very successful because they tend sometimes to be, um, well, just a chat between brothers and sisters, you have to say, to boost the morale. All right, so now I would like to deal with my second point, which is lodge business and ceremonies. Now, most lodges in the 18th century and in the first half of the 19th centuries had very repetitive activities. The lodge was opened, the proceedings of the previous meeting were, were read, visitors were introduced, new applications were presented and generally sent to a committee for a closer examination. Then applications for charity, and there were a lot at the time. Ceremonies could follow or be organized during separate meetings, extraordinary meetings. Meetings were opened and closed with a specific ritual, which took quite a long time. No specific talk was given, although lodge 
Trinosov in Paris was probably an exception. Some philosophical reflections could be presented by brothers, and in 1820, the Lodge even organized a literary competition open to all the Parisian lodges for the best work in prose, the best versified work, and the best Masonic song. Elections. Elections were organized every six months in 18th century English lodges before the two St. John's, St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist. Um, we've given examples of that in the, um, uh, in the primary sources, in the Routledge primary sources. Um, they were reported in the press sometimes, and at that time only the worshipful master was elected. In 18th century France, until the foundation of the Grand Orient in 1773, worshipful masters were appointed for life. After 1773, all the offices of the lodge were renewed every year with an election. So in France, elections have occupied brothers once a year from 1773 onwards. They might take a long time, as evidenced by the minutes of Lodge Saint-Louis de la Martinique des Frères Unis, which, by the way, met in Paris, not in Martinique, in 1843. Now, three rounds of ballots were needed before a worshipful master could be elected. Now, offices are, slightly, are still slightly different in British lodges, British American lodges, and in French lodges. Well, for instance, um, in France, we do not have any deacons, and we do not have, of course, any chaplain. I'm not going to surprise you with this. No chaplain in France. But we have an, or an orateur. Now, that's because the French are so talkative, you know that. Well, an orateur, the point is that, um, I mean, oral presentations are really at the core of French meetings. And so an orateur is required uh, inside the lodge. He has, uh, in fact, two functions. First, he should check that all the proceedings are in keeping with the constitutions of the Grand Orient, that the regulations are strictly enforced, but he also sees to it that all the brethren and now the sisters, since 2010, speak in an orderly fashion and he himself delivers all the speeches at the ceremonies. He delivers speeches and he alone can interrupt the worshipful master in case he, uh, the worshipful master uh, acts against the regulations of the lodge or in case of any mis other misbehavior. Now, one thing seems to be really universal in Freemasonry. The importance given to the festive board in Britain, and the agapes in France. However, in 18th and 19th century lodges, I have not found evidence of a gape after each meeting. Lodge Les Philosophes seems to have organized a feast once a year to which wives and children were generally invited. So the practice was not probably not very different from the ladies' nights uh, in British lodges. Today, French lodges generally spend at least one hour eating at the end of the meetings, while the meeting proper lasts about two hours. So except once a year for their banquet d'ordre, lodges organize informal meals or buffet without any ritual for the sake of conviviality. Contrary to the festive boards, which have a specific ritual, as you know. Now, what about ceremonies? Uh, receptions were almost weekly in some French lodges, as we have seen with the Lodge Encyclopédique. The Lodge minutes are very precise concerning those receptions, but much less so concerning the singing in French lodges uh, by the executive, the Conseil de l'Ordre, in 1843, the officers were upgraded for not keeping a specific register for the second degree meetings. 
And the minutes of November the 4th, 1843 stipulate that on that day, the lodge worked both at the second and third degree to organize the ceremonies of passing and raising. Now, the delay between each degree uh, in 18th and 19th century lodges uh, seems to have been quite similar in France and Britain. Masons were generally admitted, passed and raised within a year, sometimes within a month. Nowadays, things have changed. French apprentices have to wait approximately for six years before they are raised as masters. Whereas British apprentices, unless I'm mistaken, generally become masters in about three months. This is probably due to the fact that becoming a master is considered as the natural condition of a mason in Britain, whereas apprentices are considered as needing a long training in France. In French lodges, apprentices are supervised by the junior warden, who organizes regular committees to make them work on the ritual and debrief the meetings. Since they are not allowed to speak during the, the lodge meetings, they are encouraged to do so during those committees. Once they become masters, they no longer have any specific instruction. On the contrary, masters in Britain are invited to take part in rehearsal lodges organized before the ceremonies. And now I come really to uh, the third part of this presentation, which is really probably the specificity of French lodges. Uh, the planche. Now, try to, to translate this word planche or planche. It's absolutely no equation, a short presentation, generally 10 or 20 minutes in a lodge meeting, right? Um, on, a, on a symbolical, philosophical, or social topic. The presentation is followed by questions asked in an orderly manner, of course, after each warden allows the members to speak. So this is really a pattern still very similar, I think, to what happens in the House of Commons, right? Inside the House of Commons for the speaker. All the more so as the wardens tend to give the floor Ultimately, to the north and to the south, after the presentation for the discussion. Now, this, this practice is totally unknown in British lodges today, with the exception of maybe the, the prestigious Preston Lecture once a year, delivered by a certified speaker. On top of that, apprentices and fellow crowns are quite and give two presentations passed and raised now i'm not sure i don't think this is the case in british and american lodges but you will tell me uh, however in the 18th century rick bellman has shown that in the course of 10 years between 1733 and 1743 36 lectures were given in london at the old king's arms on various scientific subjects several by Martin Clare, who also lectured at the Lodge of Friendship in 1737. This practice was very similar to what took place in Paris in uh, Lodge de Neuf Sœurs, you know, the famous lodge uh, where Voltaire was made a mason by Franklin, who was then the worshipful master. So a few years before the French Revolution, or even at the um, at Lodge L'Encyclopédique in, in Toulouse. But in Britain, uh, those were the exceptions which confirmed the rule. In France, although the majority of lodges at the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th centuries were content with rituals and administrative concerns in a very similar way to British and American lodges, Lodge Trinosov was among the first to introduce philosophical and even sometimes social, subject, social subjects on a regular basis. Sometimes the orateur of the lodge was in charge of this, sometimes another brother of the lodge. In 1820, a brother 
discussed the different meanings of the word philosoph, philosopher. Six years later, the orateur welcomed the new apprentices with a speech on natural inequality, but also on social inequalities. In 1848, a brother gave a wonderful speech on buses, one of my favorites. Can we see it, please? It's <laughs> Here we are. L'omnibus. De l'omnibus, la magique influence du genre humain double l'activité. Dans l'omnibus, l'humanité s'avance vers un grand but, bien-être illimité. Now, I'm sure a lot of you understand written French, so I don't really have to translate. But you see that, I mean, uh, he explained that the, the bus, this new popular transport, really contributed to the common benefit and well-being of people, allowing them to socialize, removing social barriers. Urban people met countryside people, enjoyed leisure after work, considered each, other's, each other as brothers and sisters. So buses were truly universal and therefore truly Masonic. Now, Lodge Trinozov certainly wanted to keep up with industrial discoveries and strongly believed in scientific progress. Sharing the positivist vision of the time. A few years later, famous composer Berlioz, Hector Berlioz, composed the music of a hymn to the railways for the inauguration of the railway station in Lille. So, you know, this is the same mood, 1846 that was. All right, in the second half of the 19th century, Almost all French lodges scheduled presentations. Blanche. Thus, in 1884, Brother Bartholdi gave his first lecture on his famous Statute of Liberty, New York, behind the lodge doors for Lodge Alsace-Lorraine, a lodge set up in Paris at the time, not in Alsace-Lorraine, because it was meant to allow people from occupied Alsace-Lorraine to go on meeting. And they wanted to meet on French territory and not German territory. That was, of course, in the aftermath of the 1870 war. Parisian lodge, l'avant-garde maçonnique, founded in 1884, worked on socialism and clericalism in February 1894, and on the origin and organization of Danish, Danish socialism <laughs> a month later. Lodge Les Amis de l'Humanité, Les Amis de l'Humanité, you know, you all understand, Friends of Mankind, founded in Paris in 1846 was among the first lodges to schedule collective presentations. That is say in 1886, they asked the brothers of the lodge how to abolish poverty in France. This is slide three. <laughs> Can we see it? Yes, thank you. So all the travaux just means uh, the works. Um, solution d'une importante question sociale. So, you know, social question. And uh, what was already attempted uh, to uh, abolish misery? And um, uh, what, what is actually being done? to limit the effects of um, poverty and how, what should be done immediately to put an end to poverty, right? So that was Les Amis de l'Humanité. And they organized this in common with other lodges in Paris. So this anticipated uh, the, uh, the current practice of question à l'étude des loges, you know, because every year, since 1900, all the lodges of the Grand Orient have been working on two or three common subjects. Then the lodges send their reports to the national instance through the regional instances. 
In 1900, among the subjects proposed were how to encourage demography. Uh, this was again after the 1870 war. How to create a fund for pensioners. How to reform education. In the 20th and 21st centuries, some lodges decided to open themselves to non-Masons by organizing lectures during specific meetings with a specific ritual for non-Masons. This was the opportunity to, popular, to popularize a leading principle upheld by the Grand Orient de France ever since 1877. Um, you know, of course, 1877, when the Grand Orient de France replaced the obligation to believe in God with a liberty of conscience. And um, so nowadays, the concept of laicite, secularism, but it's difficult to translate, as you know, is explicitly mentioned in Article 1 and read at the beginning of each lodge meeting in the Grand Orient. Here we are. So it's a rather long quote, but it's Article 1. I think here again, most of you probably understand the meaning. You see that uh, in the middle, elle a pour principe la tolérance mutuelle, so of course, tolerance, le respect des autres et de soi-même, la liberté absolue de conscience, so absolute liberty of conscience, which is really um, uh, at the core. And it considers that all metaphysical conceptions are really uh, really belong to the individual and therefore um, the um, Freemasonry refuses to impose any dogmatic, uh, if you like, uh, creed, right? And uh, elle attache une importance fondamentale à la laïcité, so laïcité and liberté, égalité, fraternité. Now, today, all the lodges in France appoint a delegate to take part in regional committees on the promotion of secularism, laicity. Every year, all the lodges work on a subject related to secularism. Brothers and sisters indeed consider this to be a priority at a time when fundamentalism has been more destructive than ever. So, to conclude, <laughs> I hope I haven't been too long and you can ask questions. <laughs> right, 18th and early 19th century lodges worked in a very similar ways in France, Britain, and the States. 1877 certainly represented a landmark in the history of Freemasonry with the rift between the French and Anglo-American lodges on the issue of liberty of conscience as opposed to the obligation to believe in God, nowadays a supreme being. However, the historical context also accounts for some major differences. French lodges started discussing social issues as early as the mid 19th century. So at a time when solidarity was considered as a major issue to be addressed by the workers themselves and the state as opposed to charity, which was in the hands of the Catholic Church. Now, whereas the Church of England and dissenting Protestant churches, such as Methodism, have tended to support workers' movements, or at least have never condemned them, this was not the case with the Catholic Church, which was perceived as hostile to reform. Lodges naturally endorsed the move towards secularism in France, all the more so as the Catholic Church repeatedly condemned Freemasonry ever since 1738, as you know. Two crises, however, may well bring lodges of the world together, coronavirus and fundamentalism. All brothers and sisters might well close rank facing those two plagues. The second one being probably much more dangerous in the long term than the first. And to conclude, I would like you to have a look at this beautiful seal um, of Lodge Les Amis de l'Humanité, 
um, so which was founded in Paris in 1846, the France of Mankind. And well, it speaks for itself, I think. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm ready for your questions. <laughs> Hello, everyone. If you could just type in your questions or, or raise your hand or, or do something so that we can, uh, we can get through some of this. Ozan? Hello, yes. Yeah. Where is, where? Yeah, hi. Hello. Um, oh, I <laughs> no, no, it's fine, dear. Um, uh, Okan, could Ozan be, be unmuted? Ozan Arslan? Let me. Yeah, there you are. Okay. okay, so I have already typed my question, actually, um, during the lecture of uh, Dr. Ray uh, So first of all, um, I mean, it's very thought-provoking. I would like to thank personally very much for this. Uh, you know, very, very interesting lecture. So my question, uh, she rightly mentioned during her lecture, actually, the negative impact of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic uh, on our lodge meetings all over the world. So how would she comment, actually, on the impact of the Spanish influenza um, in the period of, like, early 1918 and spring 1920? Uh, because, uh, of, Fran of course, France was very... Uh, you know, it was wrongly named Spanish uh, flu, but, you know, it was, you know, yeah. not really Spanish <laughs> at all. Uh, it was very, very European and global. So uh, France was very badly affected, of course, after tremendous losses uh, on the battlefields, at the seas, of course, fighting against the German Empire and the Central Powers. Britain was very badly affected as well. Tremendous losses. And then, in addition to all of this, there was the Spanish influenza. And first, there was the wartime censorship. So maybe many brethren, I mean, you know, uh, in the lodges, uh, they did not really know about the uh, danger of this, um, you know, pandemic, this influenza pandemic. But later on, you know, it went on until spring 1920. So were the lodge meetings held as usual in Britain and or France, or there were some, you know, special um, precautions or measures taken? Well, well, thank you for this question. It's so good that I cannot answer it, you see. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, expect, I expect everybody at the time was um, so concerned with the war that they, they, you know, they thought that most, uh, most lodges has, had stopped working uh, on account of the First World War anyway. Um, but uh, then you're probably right, you know, probably in, in, in a lot of places, the, um, the pandemic made things worse and uh, interrupted lodge work even longer. But, well, I have no specific data on this, but this is what I expect, yes. I, I know just a little bit about this accidentally. So, of course, it, the Spanish flu comes from the United States, right? It comes from Kansas. It's our fault. Um, and my friend, Doug Russell, who was here somewhere, uh, will remember better than I the name of the, the young Mason in California who was studying uh, American Freemasons and French Freemasons getting together in, in the, um, the military camps in France uh, during the war. And I, I'm sure our American brothers gave everybody the flu. Um, but, but there were some extraordinary meetings that were going on uh, in, 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 um, in these, these military camps. Um, so even though regular lodges might, might be suspended, American soldiers were visiting French lodges in some places. And also, uh, French officers were coming into American camps. Um, Doug, are, are you there? Oh, yes, John Cooper is there, uh, and he might know as well. John, can can uh, Okan? Can you unmute John and see if he's there? John Cooper. Uh, yes. Well, thank thank you, Susan. 
And yes, our proceedings in 1918 and 19 of the Grand Lodge of California do refer to activities of our American Freemasons in France at the time. And actually, our Committee on Foreign Relations at the time came very close to recommending um, reinstituting of uh, uh, relations with the Grand Toyon de France at that time. So a closer look at the reports of our Committee on Foreign Relations during that period would probably give us some more exact answers. Yeah, yeah. Doug, Doug tells me that Jeff Counter is is the um, fellow doing the, the study. Uh, Michael McDonald, Michelle McDonald had a question. Can he be unmuted? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for all this <laughs> for all this precision, Susan. That's very interesting. Yes. <laughs> is is Michelle Michael? Michael. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the, that. Was a very interesting talk. I was interested whether the emphasis on laicity led to the Masonic French Freemasons being seen as allies of the Radical Party in French politics between after 1870, and did that discourage people from joining the craft? Um, did did it did, did 1877 discourage people from joining the craft afterwards? You said because Freemasonry would have been considered as too radical. Is that your question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Um, well, you know, don't forget that it was. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a churchman, right, Frédéric Desmond, who implemented this change, right, and so the, he was not an atheist at all, by the way. Um, now, for sure, at the time, as um, Andrew Prescott has really devoted some very interesting articles to Bradlow, to Charles Bradlow uh -huh. at the time, and uh, to the Philadelphia the Grand Lodge de Philadelphe. And the Grand Lodge de Philadelphe in Britain was indeed, yes, composed of several people, several, well, who you can consider as radicals because they, uh, they had emigrated to London after the Paris Commune, right, of 1871. And, but you see, they were not in the Grand Orient. They were in Grand Lodge de Philadelphia. Yeah. And they were in London, those. But it's true that they probably, well, I mean, Andrew argues this, and I think, I think he's, he's totally right. Andrew explains that probably the Grand, in this article, that the Grand Lodge de Philadelphia probably paved the way for 1877, right? Influence, because they had given thought to the, to the idea, to the immortality of the soul. What did the immortality of the soul, right? And they, for instance, they advocated that this should be removed. Because, you know, the grand architect was not removed from the constitution uh -huh. in 1877. Only the belief in God and the immortality of the soul, right? Dear grand architect remained. Um, but um, so, you know, I'm not sure. I think in Grand Orient, and also don't forget that uh, with the Paris Commune, you know, uh, uh, well, many people inside the Grand Orient, including the authorities of Grand Orient, did not support the Paris Commune. So uh, the Grand Orient was quite di di divided at that time. And uh, so um, uh, I'm not sure it was really perceived as very radical. Um, we have a question from Michel Gask. Is that correct? Is he still there? Okan, can you unmute him? Yeah, I think he left. Oh, I ignored him too long. I didn't mean to. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, here is a question from Demetrios to everybody. Um, but I'll read it to you, Cecile. Many jurisdictions in the continental Europe being influenced by the practice of the Grand Orient de France are continuing this practice of the lectures, the planches, on subjects such as hermeneutics, symbols, ritual, and philosophy. 
Um, so y you you have been you know widely influential again, and he thanks you for your lecture. Thank you. Do you want, do you want to to copy? Uh, do you want to 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 talk about that at all? Um. Well, you mean about the variety of Blanche, or yeah, today? and and its influence. Who who has who has copied France in doing this? Yes. Well, I think uh, uh, I'm not sure they have copied us. For instance, if you take the Grand Lodge of Belgium, inspired uh, by they've all, well, I, that's it. And they all they've always had some very interesting Blanche, you know. Yeah. And yeah. by the way. This is something that we tend to forget. It might well be that the Grand Orient copied the Grand, the Grand Lodge de, uh, de Belgique because as early as 1872, the Grand Lodge de Belgique had removed from its constitutions the obligation to believe in God. And at the time, the United Grand Lodge of England had not reacted. It only reacted in 1877 when the Grand Orient did the same thing. Yeah. So that's um, rather. But anyway, yes. And uh, but there, there's certainly an influence between the two because um, you know that very recently the Grand Orient of Belgique has also become a mixed order. That is to say, a confederation of male lodges, female lodges, and mixed lodges. Right in the in Belgium, so um, and uh, of course, well, th this is it. I think in in all the the so called liberal lodges, what we call liberal, that is to say, uh, well, meaning you know, free to believe or not to believe, and uh, allowing uh, a certain, well, really total liberty of thought. Let's say liberty of conscience. Um, in all those lodges, there are planches. There is a tradition uh -huh. of French with presentations. Right. We and as you said, it can be some of them can be very symbolical, you know, uh -huh. just uh, uh -huh. or some very ritual, some more philosophical, and some more concerned with society. All right, uh, Cla Claudio Pusa would like to speak. Claudio, yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Summers. Uh, uh, merci, Madame Ravageur. Thank you for your presentation. It was very, very interesting. Merci. Um, my question, well, you mentioned this uh, planche, and um, this is something that, to my understanding, is what, it was quite influential in many uh, Latin lodges, so uh, French lodges and... Uh, Spanish lodges and also in, in Latin America. So it's very common even today uh, to have these uh, planche or these uh, lectures uh, on social issues, on the economy, on politics. So on, on, on issues that are quite sometimes controversial. <clears throat> Comparing to uh, UK lodges or Canadian lodges or even American lodges to my understanding, this doesn't really happen. Uh, these lodges in general are more uh, tied to a ritual and they don't discuss these uh, issues in, in lodge. Perhaps they can discuss after lodge, but not during the, the meeting. So my question is, <clears throat> uh, many of these uh, Freemasonry in France and Spain and Italy and in Latin America has been more persecuted by governments, uh, probably more than in United Kingdom or Canada or United States. So my question is, addressing these uh, topics could have been maybe the reason for this persecution. So perhaps the church or the governments or the structures in place see uh, this uh, type of Freemasonry more threatening to the to the structures that are in place? Yes, it's a, it's a very interesting question, I think. Um, it's difficult to answer. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a real question. <laughs> no, because, um, well, if you, if you take all the Nazi propaganda, all the anti-Masonic uh, campaigns, 
I'm not even sure they made a difference between British lodges and French lodges. If you take, of course, Baruel in the 18th century, you know, Abbe Baruel, the Jesuit, who spoke of the, uh, of the plot. Uh, uh, well, he was the first to speak of conspiracy um, before the French Revolution. He indeed made a difference between French and English lodges. That was at the time, right? Uh, so maybe it was more subtle. But if you take, I mean, Nazi propaganda, I'm not sure they really made a difference uh, between the two types of, mis of uh, Freemasonry. No, but simply, I think here it's the historical context. It's just that, the, I mean, uh, the, France was occupied and uh, uh, Pétain's regime collaborated with uh, the Nazis and so, of course, they, they, they were adamant that Freemasonry should be eradicated from the French soil, and they forfeited all the, uh, the archives, and there was this uh, Bernard Fay who was in charge, you know, of, uh, uh, yes, of taking, of really, uh, of, of retrieving all the archives of the French, uh, uh, of the French lodges. Um, whereas in, in, in Britain, well, I have, um, I had a doctoral student working on uh, Jersey and Guernsey. And um, of course there, you know, Freemasons had to be quite careful, but, um, uh, they were encouraged to send their children away, by the way. Um, but, um, well, it was a different story because uh, uh, the, the Nazis never occupied Britain. So the, 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 they, they, they were not the same persecution. So I think it's really the historical context which is more important than what was actually, what actually took place behind the lodge door. Okay, so. thank you, Cecile. I, we, I we, just a minute, if I oh, just yeah. wanted to add something. And also, I mean, the conspiracy theories really, really uh, rested on uh, the uh, reception, in initiation, the ceremonies of Freemasonry. Uh -huh. That, that uh -huh. you know, worried them, I think, even yeah. more than the content, even more than, you know, yeah. what could be yeah. inside. Well, it's what we don't know, isn't it? Yeah. That's, that's it's what's great. scary. So, so we're, we're closing in, a, unless I hear from Ocon differently, towards the end, and we have, we have three more questions yeah. um, in the queue. And, and then I think after, after that, maybe people just need to type in their questions and, and we can, perhaps contact them later. Is that is that right, Ocon? That's good. That's good. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So David Cameron, please, if we could. Hello, Cecilia. Uh, oh, oh hello. Nice to see you. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I'm just I'm just wondering if uh, uh, if any of the ideas generated by the yearly question to the lodges uh, were ever adopted as public policy. Did they ever come up with any Thank you. Ideas. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, after World War II, for instance, uh, the Grand Orient, um, well, had set up a commission, rather a committee of brothers. It was more a committee than uh, inside the lodges, but a committee of brothers to study um, educational reform and uh, the new Ecole Normale, you know, which trained teachers. And those, I mean, really the, the structure of this Ecole Normale and the, the, the main principles of teachers' training was really um, well prepared or, uh, well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not saying it was, uh, you, you know, implemented 100%, but it really inspired the government at the time. So that was an example, yes. Um, then, more recently, they were, but not only inside the Grand Orient, but it's true that there were some discussions even about uh, contraception or about, uh, you know, even, uh, well, about suggestions for laws um, against the death penalty, that sort of thing. But then the lodges do, did not have the monopoly of this, of course, but they were, you know, among the inspirers. Yes, I think so. 
and the committees set up by the uh, both the Masonic organizations. All right, thank you. thank you. All right, I, I'm afraid I'm going to pronounce your name wrong. Kadeka? Yes. Yes? Perfect. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, brethren and sisters. Uh, bonjour, Bastien. Uh, just, I'm, I'm very happy to be at this meeting. Uh, I just asked uh, if you could tell our sisters and brethren what the masonry of the Grand Orient de France made for the Republic in France. What, sorry, what the... What, what the, the Masons made for the French Republic. I'm thinking about the Second Republic. Wow. <laughs> well, and after that, you were thinking about uh, the way uh, uh, Masons from the Grand Orient, I'm not from the Grand Orient, I'm from GLNF, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, how the Grand Orient made, put their little finger into all many French laws. <laughs> for example, we were speaking about the... the Yes, penalty, penalty, I, yes, and I, uh, maybe I, you can I, speak I, about tax, tax and gay uh, wedding, marriage, marriage. Oh, recently. Yes, mean. very recently. Oh, very recently. Yes. Well, very recently. I'm not too sure. You know, there. Um, it's. Uh, I think, of course, the, the, those issues were discussed, but. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, it, it, they, they uh, carried weight within the, uh, the government. And, uh, and apparently, recently, in recent governments, there have been very few Freemasons, from what I heard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, not as many as before. So, really, and as to the Second Republic, oh, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer you. It's, it would be too... <laughs> okay, <laughs> too okay. If, 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 if I may, uh, for uh, French-speaking... Uh, brethren and sisters, you have a wonderful book, uh, which I don't know the editor, but it's called La Franc-Maçonnerie, What the Republic's Home to the Frank, Frank Mate from, from the Masons. It's oh, written... It Patrice Morla? No, it's no, not... Uh, it's uh, Laurent Kupferman. Sorry? Laurent Kupferman. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, that's a, it's also an interesting book, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, there are not only brothers and sisters here, there are also people who are interested... Like me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> who aren't. I'm going to have to cut us off here and let Max speak, Max Wise. Yes, okay. hello. Uh, yes, uh, you can hear me? Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, uh, greeting from uh, Perpignan. Uh, in France, and uh, I would just like to uh, have uh, your opinion on uh, the future of uh, mixed gender Freemasonry in uh, Britain and uh, the United States, uh, for that matter. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> I'm not a prophet. <laughs> um, no, what I can say, you know, it's, of course, it's up to each Grand Lodge. And uh, when I went to the States, I was welcomed in California, and I met some very open-minded people, and so, but I'm not sure when <laughs> it's up to them to <laughs> admit women or not, of course, and um, and of course, you, you can also say that some sisters prefer to remain in separate organizations. This is also a fact, right? It's also a fact. Um, but things, I think things are evolving little by little, right? Uh, if you take even, well, I, I gave you the example of Belgium. I could give you the example of Portugal. Now, in Britain and the States, of course, it, it's not really for me to answer. <laughs> All right. You know, I, I teach at a Benedictine Catholic college in America, and I, I hear almost exactly the same conversation going on about women in the priesthood, but but like that's not going to happen in my lifetime. Um, so I know there's some more questions, but we need to wrap up. And I have been delegated to to give holiday greetings to everybody. So so let me read my formal statement because I can't remember all of this. So this concludes our, our lecture series for this year. Please look at the website to see the full and fascinating schedule for next year, which begins, as I mentioned before, with Cecile, Robert, and Jan 
discussing their recent multi-volume collection of primary sources in British Freemasonry. Um, further exciting lectures are already scheduled from February through September, and I'm sure the schedule will, will get filled out a little bit more. And before we depart, let me extend to you the best wishes of the Open Lectures on Freemasonry team for the happiest and healthiest of winter holidays, whether that be solstice or Christmas or Yule or Hanukkah or New Year or Pancha Ganapati, or of course, the feast of St. John the Evangelist. Good night.